by Olu Nyen and the name that may strike fear in the hearts of some still. Uh, so with that, let me turn to my topic and I'm going to try and go short because what I'd like to do is have a conversation uh, on what, I am, uh, what I'm talking about. I have to say a word about <coughs> Frost having served in the lineage of chairs of the Department of Epidemiology at Hopkins. This is the faculty circa 1935 or so. I've circled uh, Frost, uh, who was the first academic epidemiologist in the United States, hired on the Hopkins uh, from the Public Health Service, essentially, in 1918. Uh, for those of you who know the attributable risk figure, this is Mort Levin, whose 1953 paper described what we would now call population attributable risk. Miriam Braley was the first woman in the uh, Department of Epidemiology, uh, hired by Frost to work on uh, tuberculosis, and an interesting figure uh, in, her own, um, in her own right. Now, what I'm going to talk about is not about Donald Trump. <laughs> so you may be thinking, oh no, he's going to be talking about the new administration. I'm not. I'm going to talk about something that is perhaps heightened in our current political climate and its use of science, but annotates the current administration and I think is a phenomenon that has been underway for several decades that those of us who do public health and perhaps particularly epidemiology need to know and uh, understand. Now that said, we think we all know that uh, this administration has not embraced science as a basis for action. I spent quite a bit of time last week on uh, the telephone talking to reporters about uh, the EPA administrators' changes in policy around appointment of scientific advisors to the science uh, advisory uh, board. So this is a, a concern, and there is as of yet not a White House science uh, advisor. Now I'm going to begin with sort of how we teach our students about how we think epidemiology makes a difference. Of course, we're overly simplistic and naive. So let's start with that story. And I'll go back to uh, Noel's uh, statement about humble uncertainty. Decision make is, making is driven by the balancing of what we know and what we don't know, along with many, many other things. And that balance is swayed by many different uh, factors. So here I've listed some concepts for you to remember evidence, what we know. We think as epidemiologists, that's our purpose, isn't it? We're going to generate evidence. Ignorance, that's what we don't know. And I draw your attention to the wonderful book there by Stuart Farstein at Columbia that is about ignorance. It comes from an undergraduate course that he teaches. There's a related book called Failure that says we should learn from our failures. Uncertainty, the consequence of ignorance, it's, it's uncertainty. We don't know, and therefore we are uncertain. And then there's doubt, okay? And doubt can lead to uncertainty, of course, and it can delay uh, action. And the Merchants of Doubt book by Oreskes and Conway is only one of the numerous books that describe the invention of the doubt strategy. Uh, and I'll come to that story with the tobacco uh, industry. Now, here I don't want to offend anybody, but John Snow did not remove the pump handle. <laughs> Repeat after me. <laughs> John Snow did not remove the pump handle. And I think this is critical to what I'm going to say. He recommended to the Board of Guardians that the pump handle should be removed, and the Board of Guardians acted. Now, I don't know if anybody's read the COBRA event. It's not a great mystery, but I, I sort of liked his simplification of the uh, story of John Snow and the uh, pump handle, and that he removed the handle, and that's the story of epidemiology. Really, there's this paradigmatic clash between miasma and the idea that waterborne disease transmission could occur, even though, of course, the cholera vibrio organism was not yet described. That was to come. For those of you wanting a good account, uh, read The Death, The Ghost Map by Johnson, uh, which I've used in an undergrad class for years, and it's a very nice telling of this, um, of this story. And 
This is important because what I'm going to describe is what I'm going to call the John Snow model. And the idea that, in fact, there was a cholera epidemic going on. He investigated the Broad Street pump with the ghost map and, and of course, other work that he did later on on cholera in London. He inferred that water transmitted cholera and that the pump handle should be removed. And then, of course, he con continued tracking. The epidemic was already abating about this uh, time. And turned to modern public health and the role of epidemiology to identify problems. We gather data. We analyze and interpret the evidence, often directed at causation. And we translate from evidence to action and then carry out surveillance. So if the world would only work that way, <laughs> we would gather evidence and things would happen. Maybe sometimes it does. Perhaps in Flint, the evidence was overwhelming. And sometimes with acute outbreaks, that is the case with our slower epidemics that perhaps so often take so many lives prematurely, we don't act so quickly and the evidence often needs to pile up. So, you know, if I were a teenager, I would just say that, not, and uh, the world is much more, uh, much more challenging. Now, part of the challenge has been the creation of doubt. And I, I do think we should give the tobacco industry credit for this. Some of you may have seen what is called the Frank Statement, published in most newspapers and periodicals in the United States in 1954. It has a little trial exhibit because this has appeared in many courtrooms. And it was from this point that we can document through the industry's own documents, its campaign of fraud uh, and misleading the public. If you've not read Robert Proctor, the Stanford historian's book, uh, chronicling this story from the industry's own documents, read it. It's good. He's angry. He tells a good story. Now, in fact, the doubt creation can be created, uh, can be traced to a meeting of the tobacco industry lawyers and executives held at the Park Plaza in 1953, now all nicely documented again by our ability to use the industry's documents to get at this uh, story. They realized then, as you will see, that doubt is their product. And it was this creation of doubt that led to the Department of Justice decision uh, by Judge Gladys Kessler in 2006. Again, you might put on your reading list the Kessler opinion, all 15 or 1,700 pages of it. It's remarkably um, articulate. Uh, in fact, in storytelling. So, and soon we will have finally the corrective statements to be made by the industry, undoing now, decades later, the lies that they told to the uh, public. And their realization there, this is a well-known quote, doubt is our product since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public. Now, I'm going to tell you just one example of the creation of doubt. Perhaps one of the most uh, significant societal changes around tobacco came with the uh, conclusion from the 1986 Surgeon General's reports and other documents that secondhand smoke caused lung cancer in non-smokers. And here is the first conclusion of that report. The third conclusion says simply separating smokers and non-smokers in the same airspace does not protect. Putting a line down the middle does not protect. I just came uh, from Rome yesterday. Here's an age-related question. How many have been on an airplane where, where there was smoking? And you ask that, and then younger people will look at you with surprise there was smoking on airplanes. Imagine, that. how could there be smoking on airplanes? Yeah, and just everybody can, uh, everybody was there. Remember, so here is evidence to action. I testified before the House Subcommittee on Aviation in 1987, and I remember it was said that how could people would not obey if there was an in-flight smoking ban. Pilots would not be able to fly. <laughs> Probably planes would come crashing down because of the lack of concentration. Now if you smoke, you're arrested. Now, some years ago, Tom Burke and I at uh, Tom and Hopkins wrote a paper on uh, the strategy of doubt creation around secondhand smoke. And I just will point out to you that it sort of goes through the whole set of possibilities. And in a way, it's sort of 
epi one upside down. We say think about confounding and selection bias and other forms of bias. And what does the industry say? They say these biases are unavoidable, uncontrollable, and all epidemiology is flawed. That's, ever heard that? That's doubt creation. Uh, attack epidemiology, weak, soft science. Can't really answer questions. They don't do RCTs for things like the smoke and kill people. Imagine that. Um, methodological problems. Uh, doing counter, what I call counter science, their own studies. Hiring critics, still done. Creating scientific societies and journals, even that happened in the indoor air quality world. And then of course, harassing research is a tactic that is still playing out, not just by the tobacco industry, in fact, but by others. So these are tactics. And if you want more, here's a selection of books. There are many more, but if you start with one, then perhaps the Arrescus and Conway, if you, if you don't want to read a book, there's even a documentary, there's a movie. Okay, and it's a great movie, it starts with Stan Glantz from uh, UCSF, a long time uh, tobacco control person, and, and uh, it's a good watch. Now, so that's doubt. But what I want to switch to, and I hope you'll see the contrast, is this idea that belief is equal to or can outweigh evidence. So I'm not saying doubt is undermining the evidence, but the switch here is that something else is going on that I think is very important to our field. Belief being at least equal to um, evidence. You know, like as said by the dude. I hope you know who the dude is. <laughs> and if not, then you have to go watch the video Lebowski. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like your opinion. I guess it should be man or woman, but he's the dude. Um, there are, again, books that you might turn to. I was on a panel recently with uh, Tom Nichols, uh, and he's written about this, The Death of Expertise, the campaign against established knowledge and why it matters. So some examples that you know and can easily think of, childhood vaccination and autism, climate change, evolution at times, genetically modified organisms, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones. And this is not a matter necessarily of knowledge. This is the state of California where it was possible to get a personal exemption for children from vaccination until the law was changed because so many people had obtained that, that, that uh, exemption. And this is a map of the state. And for those of you who uh, know the state of California, those areas with the most affluent, most educated people, in fact, tended to have uh, the highest rates of non-vaccination. So this wasn't a question of necessarily evidence, but just that underlying belief somehow that these vaccinations were harmful. So as described by Nichols, this death of expertise is a rejection of science and dispassionate rationality. At least, if you go back to the founding fathers of the United States, they believed in science and reason. <clears throat> Some of them were citizen scientists themselves. Think about Franklin or Jefferson, just as easy examples. So an expert, by virtue of being an expert, becomes somebody not to be listened to. So, and in our political system, and this last is important, that equal rights may mean that opinion of everyone holds equal weight, and opinion is viewed as balancing or equivalent to evidence. So what has happened? Our science has become politicized. Climate change, for example, we'll see. Many lament a decline of scientific literacy and numeracy. Uh, fake news, fake science disseminated quickly and widely. The devaluation of experts and expertise, and what I'll call a high level a dissing of science, and we'll come to a personal example. You might put on your reading list this book by Sean Otto, though about two years out now, The War on Science, which goes through things, this situation in great detail. He's right, science is political. We get evidence, we judge it. Science creates knowledge. Knowledge is power, 
and that power is political. And it's the power, I think, that leads to this path of backlash, again, distinct from the creation of doubt by stakeholders whose interests may be affected by science. Here's a graph. It shows the uh, probability of respondents saying there's solid evidence of recent global warming due mostly to human activity by level of scientific, quote, intelligence as engaged by some ind indices. And you can see that as people become perhaps more science literate, they split by party, by political, uh, by political belief. This is the politicization, I said that without stumbling, of science, okay, a concern. Public confidence in scientists has remained stable for decades at 40%, okay? What about the other 60%? Uh, why aren't we credible? So I guess it's good news that we're not sinking, uh, but we are not going up. And overlying this, and I think this will not be news to many, is that we have frames by which we look at uh, evidence by which we look at science, by which we bring our prior uh, beliefs. And this is um, uh, some thoughts from Kahn, who's really drawing on the work of Kahneman and uh, Tversky here around uh, the framing of our beliefs and, uh, and judgments based in part on who we are. And here's a plot based, giving four quadrants of where we stand uh, personally on hierarchy, and egalitarianism, uh, and individualism, and belief in what's called communitarianism over here on the, uh, on the plot. And you can think about which quadrant you are in, but you can see, for example, gun control as high risk in that top left column, and low risk in that bottom right column. Okay, and you can see that the point here is that how we frame actions in public health and elsewhere depends on our background belief system. So this is about belief and of course this will set how we view evidence, not coming necessarily from a neutral stance. So hence said this only coal miners in West Virginia would believe that Trump is actually going to put the miners back to work or having guns in schools is likely to save lives. Again, these are different quadrants. Now, this comes into our politics. Uh, Paul Braun, congressman from Georgia, in fact, is on the House Science Committee. You can see here's his views of what he learned in medical school. I'll give you a moment to, lead, to read that. House Science Committee member. Now, I talked about the role of the high level dissing of science and I think in terms of us as experts epidemiologists translating our information we have a new ground thank God a panel of experts I will say I have to credit Leon Gordas my longtime uh, predecessor at Hopkins for this uh, for this cartoon which uh, is multi used by me uh, because uh, of this uh, issue of experts and expert judgment and our role in uh, taking action in government and non-governmental sectors. This high-level disting is a challenge. Uh, I'll highlight something here in a moment. I've testified here before the House Science Committee on work I've done uh, at the uh, National Academy of Sciences on looking at assessment of the risks of chemicals. Uh, the hearing is actually chaired by uh, Congressman Brown. The uh, chair, full committee chair, Congressman Hall, walks into the hearing room uh, as the hearing is winding down. And here's the exchange. Chairman Brown, uh, now recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Chairman Hall, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In as, as, much, in as much as I don't know what questions have been asked or answers elicited, and as much as I probably wouldn't believe anything any of the three of you say, I yield back my time. I call this high-level dissing of science. I was a little bit stunned by this. Uh, I was there with uh, Paul Anastas, uh, a pioneering green chemist and the head of research and development at EPA and someone high up from the government 
accounting uh, office. But notice the word believe appears. Okay, believe. So, and this is key, and I'm just going to whine a minute more about being attacked by uh, Jim, Senator Imhoff, uh, over my work as chair of the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, and how I must come with um, background beliefs, and that's stated in, uh, in here. I'm afraid I'm probably the poster child for those who will no longer be appointed to the Science Advisory Board committees of the EPA. So what are we going to do in this sort of post-evidence uh, era? So back to Jefferson for a moment. This is a, a great quote about the need to have people be informed and uh, the relationship of the success of our government. Otto has some ideas. I will say number one is do something. Uh, and he covers a number of different issues. I'm sorry for the numbering, which seems to have uh, slipped here. It's interesting, this preaching in the age of science, I just actually came from a meeting at the Vatican that was on uh, climate change and air pollution. And there are two representatives of, ec of evangelical organizations there who work on bringing the climate change issue to the fore in evangelical con congregations. Scientific code of ethics, that might be useful on this belief and doubt uh, issue, for example. Bringing science into the discussion of elections would be important. I highlighted scientists need to fight back. We need to find our voice. So if you take number one, do something, and number 12, fight back, 